lifting our hands up high. Give us a reason to testify. When the Spirit falls, we sing glory, glory. Let the glory come down. We sing glory, glory. Let the glory come down. That we can't explain. Let it fall like a holy rain. Bring us all, make us strong, bring us to our knees. Show us your presence, Holy Spirit, please. Appreciate that. Well, that ought to get you excited and ready to worship this morning, hasn't it? If that doesn't, you may need to go check your heart. I'll tell you, that was great. We appreciate that, Ron, Hannah, choir. It's wonderful. Well, we are happy that you're here with us this morning. If you're visiting for the first time this morning, or maybe you've been visiting for a couple of times and haven't picked up your free gift out at the welcome desk, if you'll go by there right after church, we have a free gift for you. It's just kind of us saying thank you for being here and thank you for taking time out of your day to join us as we worship God this morning. Well, we have a, a special guest this morning, and he's going to come after Ron gets through singing and uh, the choir gets through, and he's going to bring God's word to us. It's Jeff Gray. He is a former IB, IM, I said IBM. He's an IMB, IMB missionary for 15 years, and he is currently the discipleship pastor at Living Truth Ministries in Pace. So, like I said, as soon as Brother Ron gets through and gets finished singing, 
and praising God through music and song, we're going to have him come and lead us in our worship service. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day, Father. And wow, what a great way to start the service, Father, singing glory, praises to your name. Father, thank you so much for the opportunities that you give us each and every day, Father. We are so grateful for the things that you do for us. Father, we know that you're still in control of everything that happens, Father, and of that we're grateful. Father, thank you again for the blessings that you pour out on us each and every day. Father, we pray that as we continue with the singing, continue with the preaching, Father, that everything that is said, everything that is done, every word that is spoken here today brings honor and glory to you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, let's just take time right now. Everybody stand up and let's just welcome each other to our service today. standing we're going to join our voice in praise to our lord to god be the glory great things he had done all right church let's sing to god be the glory great things he has done so loved he the world that he gave us his son to yield his life and atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth Everybody say, come on. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, a fireless offender who truly believes that more Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth 
Let's give our Lord a praise today. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Jesus and silver 
Would you pray with me? Father, truly, we would rather have Jesus than anything this world has to offer. And Lord, today we seem to be surrounded by so much evil in this world. So much sin. And Father, just seemingly hopeless situations. But Lord, we know that if we have you in our hearts and in our lives, if we trust in you, if we seek your face, Lord, you will see us through. And Father, we just want today to acknowledge you as Lord and Savior, creator of the universe, and worthy of our praise. And Father, we just ask that you be with us today in a special way. Move among us today as only you can. Open our hearts to what you have for us. And Father, speak to us. Guide us. Lord, we need your direction. We need your guidance. We need your love. We need your mercy. We need your forgiveness. And Father, may everything we do here today bring honor and glory to that precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Praise forever to the King. 
church. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. My name is Jeff Gray, and I'm the discipleship pastor at Living Truth Church in Chamukla, Florida. I see you heard me, Chamukla. And the first time I ever heard of that place, I thought he was joking. Um, but they weren't, and um, I've been serving there as the discipleship pastor for about a year now. And prior to that, um, my wife and I, along with our three daughters, uh, served for almost 15 years with the International Mission Board. And in that time, we lived in three countries of Africa. We began our career in Africa in the country of Malawi, where we studied a language of a Muslim people group. After two years of study, we left Malawi, which we thought was a really hard place to live, and we moved to the bush of Mozambique. And um, when I say bush, I mean bush. I mean, no electricity, had to burn, hot, burn fires to have hot water, no cell phone, no internet. And we basically lived in the zoo. And the only thing that kept the lions and the crocodiles and hippos and all the other animals from us was a chain link fence about six feet tall. In the midst of all that, I've killed cobras and mambas and you name it, I've killed it in my yard. I would also say that's probably one of the most challenging things in my life I've ever had to endure. I still ask the Lord today, why would you send me to that place? I'm a city boy. And I remember my first encounter, and this, I'm not making this stuff up. I remember my first day living in the bush. I, I don't know what I'm doing, okay? I, I really don't. And um, in this area where we moved to, there were probably, uh, at, the po- at that point, probably three known believers among a million people that we knew of. And I remember the first day there, going in the house and trying to get the kids settled and my wife settled and just sorting things out of this new life we were going to start. Um, my wife went in the kitchen and turned on the water. Well, the water didn't come on. I'm like, seriously? Like, day one, a water doesn't work? And so I remember... I, like, I don't know what to do. I, I guess I'll go outside and see if the, see if the generator's plugged in, uh, tap on a w- couple of pipes and see if that'll fix it, you know, go out and look at the water pump. And went outside and m- met a man named Luigi, and he, I asked him in my broken Chiao language, the water is not working, do you know the problem? And so he didn't have the answer. And I said, what should we do? And he looks at me, the missionary, and says, well... We should pray. I felt about that big. This guy that has known Jesus for a very short amount of time telling the missionary we should stop and pray when something doesn't work. So we did. We stopped and prayed. And I can tell you without any other handiwork on my side that a very short time later the water started working. To my surprise, but not to his. I learned a lot in that place. Difficult life, and then we did that for almost three years, and it almost killed me in every way. It almost killed me physically and emotionally, and I'll even say spiritually. It was the hardest, most darkest place I've ever lived. We came home, and I was done. I I was, I was done. As a matter of fact, when I left the bush, I packed every box and labeled it what was inside because that was my contents for the moving company. I wanted to come home. I wanted to come back to America and get back into the school system. I left a really great career in the school system as a school principal and was looking at a superintendency role 
when God called me out of that to the, to the harvest. Came home, sitting at my kitchen table one evening, had friends around the table, us talking, and our friends are looking at our passports, and they were stamped with all kinds of stamps from all over the world. We've been traveling all over Africa. And my youngest daughter comes in the room, and one of our friends says to her, Viv, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Now, keep in mind, we had just come home from three years over there. We were exhausted and tired. And, you know, when you come back to America as a missionary, your family spoils you, your church spoils you. So they take you to the, all the theme parks, you know, all the fun stuff you can possibly do. They take you to do in that first month you're there. And so I'm thinking that she's feeling pretty good about this new life in America because I'm hoping that she's, I'm going to be able to sell it to her. And she looks at this person without any hesitancy, and she said, Mapuje. That was, our, that was the little village that our bush house was in. And my wife and I just looked at each other, and I think both of our mouths fell open simultaneously. Like, what is she talking about? And the lady, of course, was shocked too, because, I mean, Vivian came in, she had powdered, powdered donut all over her face, and big hair or swimsuit on, sunburn from the park and all this fun stuff she had been doing. She has none of that in Mapuche, not a single iota of that in Mapuche. The biggest event in Mapuche was my trampoline. All the village kids played on our trampoline in the yard, in the middle of the jungle. And the lady said to her, Viv, why in the world do you want to go back to Mapuche? And Vivian's response was very simple. She said, because I haven't finished sharing the gospel with my friend Anna yet. That's the power of the gospel. It was lacking in my life. You know what we did? We, we, we went back. And I'm telling you, my wife and I took turns crying on the way back. I'd smile and be strong for a while, then she'd strong and be strong and smile for a while. It was hard. But the gospel calls us to do hard things. People keep talking about following Jesus, your life gets better. No, it doesn't. He tells you it's going to get worse in so many ways. And so this morning, I just want to tell you about what the Lord has laid in my heart for this church. But I think it's also a message for the church worldwide because I feel like we've forgotten the gospel. In 2018, we were back in America. God was redirecting our steps. We weren't sure where he was calling us. We were willing to go. We just didn't know where. And so God ended up putting us with a group of people that work all of South Asia. I'm not going to say their names. But these men and women are people that are called to the harvest in some of the most difficult, challenging places in the world. As a matter of fact, this morning as we meet here, there are people in India praying for you. As a matter of fact, the people in India, they, they pity the American church. I get asked over and over again by my Indian brothers, what is that church in America doing? Why are they quiet? And as a part, me as a part of the American church, I can't defend it. And so this morning, I want to I share a message with you that God's put on my heart for you. But I want you to understand that this comes from me from 2018 until 2000 in March of 2020. My role was to, was to join, what, join that team that goes into all of South Asia, go into places, try to find people that have a heart for Jesus Christ, that love the gospel and want to share with other people, and then light a fire and see what happens. That was my role. And I loved my role. I was living in Chiang Mai, Thailand with my wife and my daughter, and every, every month I was in one of those places in South Asia for two weeks at a time. 
spending hours and hours and hours traveling to some of those locations by bus, by train, however I could get there to light fires so the gospel would move in a place where it's complete darkness. So please hear me when I say this morning that this message that I have for you this morning, it's not for me, it's from him. I think what we don't understand from the gospels of Jesus Christ is that when he speaks and he gives commands, his commands come with expectation. And if Jesus has expectations for us, there should be some urgency in our lives. But there's not. There's just not. And so this morning, as I begin to open the word with you, I want to pray. And my heart for you is you just stay with me this morning. That you'd hear from the Lord this morning. And that God would change Mariana because of you and people in this room. That's what he wants. So let's pray and then let's jump into the word. Father, in Jesus' name, we, we come before you this morning. I pray, Father, that during this time as we open your word, that you will speak into our lives. And, Father, that we will hear your voice and then we'll do what you say that will do what you say because we love you because you're because you're our king and I pray this in Jesus name amen if you have your bible and I hope you do turn with me to Matthew chapter 28 Matthew 28, <clears throat> and we're going to look at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Some of you might already be thinking about closing your Bibles because you already know this passage. Please keep it open. And I hope that it will speak to you a little differently this morning. Matthew 28, 18 and 20 says this, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Question, is that a familiar passage to you? We know it, right? I bet there's most of you could probably stand up and quote it pretty close to what I just read, word for word. I heard one pastor say, a while back that this passage is probably the most well-known and least obeyed passage in Scripture. We know the Great Commission, but in our lives as a local church in America, it's really become the great omission. We've forgotten this, this command of Jesus. Now, hear me when I say when Jesus speaks, he's not giving us a suggestion. It's a command that should be obeyed. And one of the best examples I can give you about the difference between a suggestion and a command of something of obedience, when, when I travel India, I travel and I train and I train for three days, four days, and I, train and I pack up and I go somewhere else and I train for three or four days and just keep moving around trying to start fires and see where it sticks. And every place that I go in India, if you haven't been there, it's a pretty crowded place. 1.7 billion people. And as you travel, you realize that if you're in a car or in a bus, 
there really aren't any rules. It's kind of every man for himself. And I always make this joke when I'm in India because I, I, I talk to them about when you're out sharing the gospel, you're going to get a red light, a yellow light, or a green light when you share the gospel. A red light means stop. I'm not interested and leave me alone. Red. Yellow means sounds interesting, but I need to proceed with caution. And a green light means go. I'm ready to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's the red, yellow, green strategy we talk about at our church at Living Truth and over in India. But when I talk to Indians, I say, you know those red, yellow, and green lights at the intersections in your, in your city? Mm-hmm. Those, those aren't anything other than Christmas decorations. Because nobody abides by them. You can sit at a green light all day long and nobody moves. And then red light, everybody's going. When I travel there, I have no idea what's going on. Because the rules aren't followed. They're merely suggestions. And typically, it's the biggest car wins. When we look at the passage, this passage of Scripture, Jesus isn't giving us a soft invitation. He's like, well, if you have capacity, if you're not too busy, if it fits into your schedule, it's a command. And as, as I look at this passage, and when I look at this passage overseas, I'm going to give it to you just like I give it to them. When I look at verse 18, I say that this is Jesus speaking, and Jesus says, I have all authority. When Jesus tells you to do something, you don't need permission from your pastor. Or a committee. Or your spouse. When Jesus speaks, we obey. He has all authority. But so many times, the Lord tells us to do something, right? And what do we do? Well, I need to talk to pastor about that because I don't know if that's a good thing. Or... Uh, you know, I, I better pray about it. When the Lord tells you to do something, why would you need to pray? Jesus has all authority. So when Jesus speaks into your heart, just do what he says and do it immediately. Because one of the things we talk about overseas a lot is this idea that delayed obedience is disobedience. When Jesus speaks, we act. Period. He's all authority. And his first words in, in, to follow is he tells us to go. Jesus said go. Jesus said, go, not come. We, we think this idea of, of making disciples means we gather in a place like this every Sunday morning and we stand up and we sit down and we stand up and we go home. Jesus said, go. And for some reason, as the American church, we've been comfortable with going to church and not going out in the harvest. We do our time on Sunday morning, we watch our watches, and we go beat everyone else to the restaurants. It's what American churches do. But Jesus tells us we have to go to the harvest. Simple, right? Go. Then he says what? Jesus says, all authority is given to me. Go and make church members, right? That's what he says. No, he says, go and make disciples. And around the world, it's the same thing. 
Every church is so busy. Every church spends so much time and resources and energy on growing their membership that they forget about the kingdom. And you know, when you look around, and I've been a part of it, I've seen it happen in my own life. When you've been around churches that split, people get mad and get angry over the color of carpet. They get mad over the color of the walls. The pastor preaches too long. He preaches too short. The music's too loud. It's too soft. We give all these reasons about why we stay at a church or why we don't. How about the kingdom of God is why we stay? What about the unity of the body? But here's the deal, guys, is when you have a church full of church members, all you do is fight and bicker. Because it's more of a club than it's a church. But when you get a building full of disciples, people don't care about the frivolous stuff. They don't get bent out of shape on the colors. They don't get bent out of shape on the color of the program that is given out when you come in the door. They want to talk about Jesus and Jesus glorified. And they want to worship. And they want to take the gospel outside the doors of this building. That's what disciples do, and that's what Jesus called us to make. Make disciples. See, that's what I've, I've been tasked to do at my church. And we, we've, had to, we've had to make some changes. I, I'm introducing things that we do overseas to make disciples into an American DNA. Let me tell you how hard that is. Praise God, the church I'm a part of, they're hungry. Part of a church that they want the kingdom to come in our community. We've got a church full of people that are out sharing the gospel. As a matter of fact, I think they're going to baptize nine or ten people today. And it's not because of the work of the pastor. Yeah, he shares the gospel. This is the people that sit in the pews every week of getting excited about Jesus and then going to the harvest. Living their faith out in a lost world. Because they understand the simple passage that we we memorize, we just don't obey. Jesus said, make disciples, not church members. And there is a significant difference. And then Jesus goes on and he continues to write and to, to, to say, as we make disciples of all nations... All, not some. It means we don't get to pick and choose who hears the gospel. If you're racist, if you're prejudiced, you can't honor the Great Commission. If you find yourself better than another person, you can't honor the Great Commission. If I'm not mistaken, the Bible tells us that Jesus died for all people. So who are we to pick and choose? And we go both ways, right? We see a a homeless person like, oh, they're scary. Stay away from that. They might hurt me. So we ignore the homeless person, but then we sit in a coffee shop next to someone that's sipping a latte and they have on their business suit. We're like, whoa, he might be too smart, so I better not talk to him. And we excuse ourselves away from all people. But Jesus said, all, not some. We don't pick and choose. And after he says, make disciples of all nations, he tells us to baptize them. And we know about baptism. We're Baptists, for crying out loud. We understand it, right? But here's the thing I think, you, that I think we've missed, 
And it's gotten me in a lot of trouble overseas because a lot of churches overseas have a very strong hierarchy. Let me give you an example. When we talk about baptism, we look at this passage. Who is Jesus telling, who is Jesus talking to? The disciples, right? And what does he tell his disciples to do? Go and baptize them, right? Disciples baptize. So this morning at our church, I think between 9 and 11 being baptized, I think we have between 4 and 6 people getting in the water to baptize them. If you lead someone to Jesus Christ, you should baptize them. There is no place in Scripture where it tells us that pastors baptize. And if I'm going to err on the side of making a mistake, I'm going to follow the command of Jesus versus my opinion. And Jesus tells his disciples to baptize. Now, I had a funny experience in India. I was teaching a group of uh, Indian uh, pastors. Their husbands sat here in this, in this aisle. The women sat on this side. That's how they do it culturally. Men here, women there. And I did this three-hour lesson from the Bible on baptism. Three hours of walking them through the book of Acts, showing examples of how disciples baptized. After we went through all the passages, went through Ephesians, why we're baptized, why we're not baptized, we covered the whole thing. At the end of it, we get up and we get partners and we practice baptizing. Men baptize men, women baptize women, and we, and we do like air baptisms, right? We're practicing in the air, like standing in a room like this, practicing how you give baptism. Everybody's practicing. Men are practicing. Women are practicing. Everyone's practicing. It's pretty comical, too, because you have these young kids that are body slamming each other down. They don't know how to do this. Then you have this one, the last time I was there, <clears throat> this woman was baptizing her friend, and she held her down for like three minutes. I'm like, you got to bring her up, sister. you got to bring her up. And she would bring, and we had a good laugh about that. But they've never had experiences baptizing because their pastors won't let them. The pastor wants the attention on him when, they, when people get baptized. Look at me. This is my church. These are my people. This is my work. But I'm telling you, when you unleash that, that, that authority and you open your hands of authority to let disciples baptize disciples, they're going to get more fruit. So in this passage, Jesus tells us to baptize them. We know that baptism comes after salvation. We know it's by immersion. But what we don't practice is the idea that disciples baptize. We always do it in community. But we baptize. Here's the cool thing for me that I learned overseas is when I released authority for people to baptize, guess what? If you baptize someone, they become your baby to grow up, not mine. You're going to disciple that person that you baptize. Don't look at pastor. Don't look at leader. You baptize them, you're going to grow them up to maturity. Talk about a burden lifted. We baptize them. And then Jesus closes out this command by saying, and we teach them to obey. I think we have a church, as a church have replaced that word obey for no. K-N-O-W. I'm a part of you. And I can probably go outside to my car and turn the radio on and probably find a Christian radio station. Probably more than one as I drive back toward Pensacola. Apps readily available. Audio books readily available podcast, all available, everything's available here. If you want it, you can get it easily and usually free. We know so much. But we do very little. 
Do you think that one day we're going to stand before Jesus at judgment and he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you read a hundred books? That you got a degree in theology? That you can quote scripture? See, I think about these things, the things that we study, the things that we read, and I think we do all of these things and we've never yet shared the gospel with our neighbor. We rub elbows every day at work with people that have never, don't even know we're Christians. Oh, but we know. We know. But we do little. I think Barna did research a while back, if you're familiar with Barna, and looking through different data, it looks like, from what I can tell, Statistically, that in America, 98% of the church hasn't shared the gospel. You realize there's a direct correlation between baptism and gospel sharing, right? If you don't share the gospel, the only people you're going to baptize is people that maybe came out of a, a Catholic background that realize they need to be immersed. I think about this idea of obeying and I think about <clears throat> all the churches that I've spoken in over the years as a missionary and I can't tell you how many churches I've been in where people have been at church, in church on a weekly basis for 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years and they're still taking classes on how to share the gospel. That makes no sense to me. I was in a church in Texas about two years ago and a man had been in the church for 50 years. As we sat around the table, I said, so brother, 50 years, wow, that's amazing. Praise the Lord. So when you share the gospel, what, what gospel presentation are you using? He looked at me like I was a foreigner, an alien. He said, pardon? I said, yeah, 50 years, man. You've got a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience. So what gospel do you share? What presentation are you using? He had no idea what I was talking about. 50 years of sitting in the pews of a church and can't share the gospel. So my, my question goes to, what are we doing in the church when our people can't share the gospel? If you want to die, that's the way you do it. You don't share the gospel. It's going to, over time, we're all going to be gone. There's going to be no one left. One of the things we've talked about at Living Truth is something our pastor calls DNBS. Do nothing Bible studies. I've been a part of them, and probably you have too. You might be a part of one right now, you know, where a group of people gets a book to study that's someone other than, um, other, other book other than this, and you get together and you read a chapter, and then you meet again and you talk about how it makes you feel. You paraphrase a couple of your favorite quotes. You might post it on Facebook, something really touched your heart. All the while, your neighbor has never heard the gospel and dies and goes into eternity without Jesus. You see, these Bible studies we spend all of our time looking through and doing as groups, if they don't lead to, lead to kingdom change and engagement, we've got to stop doing those and get back to this book and obeying what this book tells us to do. Because Jesus is clear. For some reason, we've taken on the opinions of man and they've superseded the, the, the words of Jesus. So yeah, read your books, but make this one your priority. Obey this one. Live this one. We talked about these ideas of these, we, we, we stopped as a church doing these DNBS studies. 
They're leading to nothing. Well, I take that back. They lead to a bunch of smart people that do nothing. And we don't want to be those people. We want to look at the word of God. We want to do what it says. See, we, we've decided that we're going to pursue a disciple-making movement in our church. We want to make disciples, then make disciples, then make more disciples. We're chasing it. Last year, as we began this process, we, we doubled or almost tripled our number of baptisms in the year. I think this year, I think we've missed about four Sundays that we haven't baptized in the whole year so far. And it's not because of what pastor's saying at the pulpit. It's what people are living when they leave this place. Our priorities have changed from programs to gospel. From church to kingdom. And I'm telling you, listen to me very carefully, is when you pursue the kingdom of God, your church will grow. And why is all that so important? You know, in India, a person dies, in South Asia, a person dies every second. In India, 25,000 Indians die every day. And 98% of them do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, nor have they heard the gospel. Now, India is a long way from here. But what about Florida? When I look at statistics for Florida, 721 Floridians enter eternity every day. 721 a day in this state of Florida. Half of them claim no religious affiliation. The portion that do claim a religious affiliation come from anything from Jehovah's Witness occult all the way through what sits in this room today. I'd, I'd dare say that 75% of those people that are in the 741 don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they could be your neighbor and they never heard. Seven twenty one today. And when I teach around the world in places that I go, I realize there's two things that keep us from obeying this passage. Our calendars and our comforts. We're too busy. We're too busy to go out and share the gospel. But we have time to watch Netflix every, every evening for a couple of hours. We can spend hours and hours on the lake and on the river and go a whole year without sharing the gospel. Our comforts, yeah, we don't want to offend anybody. I don't know if you notice it, they don't mind offending us. If I'm going to offend you with Jesus, you're going to be offended. But our calendar and our comforts, which one, are, which one is most impact on your life? Your calendar, you're so busy you can't serve your king? If you're too busy that you can't serve your king, you've got the wrong king. You know, we, we're a comfortable people, right? You're, America's rubbing off on me, let me tell you. The other night I got up out of bed, I was hot. I went in and thermostat was on 73. I was like, what in the world's going on in here? I was sweating at 73. I lived 15 years without air condition. In, in tropical places. And now I'm worried about my 73 degrees is too warm for me. It's rubbing off. I can feel it. Are you so comfortable you can't honor your king? (laughs) 
I guess as I close my time with you this morning, my, I guess my prayer for you this morning is that if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you make him your king today. My other prayer would be if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ, then act like one. He's called you to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. What are you doing? If you're doing that stuff, praise the Lord, keep going. And if you're not, why not? Too busy or too comfortable? One thing I've learned about my relationship with Jesus is that he always lets me come home. When I stray, when I wander, when I doubt, when I'm lazy or selfish, he lets me come home. Maybe this morning, I don't know what you're dealing with this morning in your life, but everywhere you go, there's people have got stuff, right? Everybody you engage has got stuff going on in their lives. So much brokenness, hopelessness, confusion, evil. And I like what Jesus says as he closes out this idea of making disciples. His final words were, and I will be with you. To the very end. You want his presence in your life? Then do what he says. Funny how that works. Obey your king. He's got your back. He's with you. Even in the midst of your trials, he's with you. And so if you want, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to pray. I appreciate your attention this morning. In the days ahead, I'll be praying for you as a church. That you guys, if you're not already serious about the gospel, that you'll get that way. Now just keep in mind, it won't take all of you. I mean, Jesus had 12. It just takes a handful of people to get some something going. It's always fun in groups. But let's obey the words of Jesus. Let's do what he says. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we we thank you, thankful for the simplicity of your word. We thank for you, thankful for your Holy Spirit that is actively working in this place. Father, whether it's calling someone to repentance or it's convicting of sin, we know that your word is living and active. And I pray for this church. I pray for Eastside Church this morning. I pray, Father, that this will be a church that shines a bright light into the darkness of this community. That this is a group of people that will be serious about the going. Father, that much fruit would come from this church. Father, that this be a church that would seek your will, that would seek your ways, and they would do so in unity for the sake of the gospel. Father, I pray your blessings on this church, your protection, and your guidance in the days ahead. And I pray this in the precious and beautiful name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Let's sing together.
this morning and like I've always said every time I'm here the invitation never ends if you would like to talk to someone or need to speak to someone please call the church office see me after church see brother Jeff he'd love to talk with you anyone that you know is a Christian see them and talk with them and they can show you how you too can become a Christian we do appreciate you being here this morning don't forget if you're visiting with us for the first time to uh, get your gift at the welcome desk and I have one quick announcement the joy club and wings meeting was moved from Wind Street Park due to possible weather. Uh, it's going to be here upstairs at 10 o'clock uh, Tuesday morning, so make note of that in your, in your account. On those on Facebook, we appreciate you being here. Please join us again, and as we dismiss from Facebook, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to please have a seat uh, real quick. Brother Al has a uh, quick word from the pastor.